Okay, let's uh, take our Bibles open to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs. Uh, we're looking uh, for wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And uh, we're not to do it with anything wavering. And we ask in faith that the Lord will do it. So, and where do we find faith? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So it's not going to just fall out of the sky. It's got to be based on something. At our last, we were in chapter 11. In our last meeting, we uh, were looking at that wisdom through some contrasted values uh, that were found in 17 through verse 21. So 17 had dealt with compassion, uh, contrasted by cruelty. 18, uh, deceitfulness, contrasted with dependability. And 19, life found with life forfeited. So Lord willing, we look at the next few verses and possibly beyond. You never know how this goes. So verse 20, we want to start here in verse 20 tonight. They that are of a froward heart are abomination to the Lord, but such as are upright in their way are his delight. All right, so we have approval mixed with abomination. Uh, so a froward heart. There's a lot of, a lot of words that I can use here. Um, distorted, crooked, uh, perverse, uh, false, fake. All right, all of those are a froward heart. There's nothing real. I mean, it, it may be real to the person that's doing this, but none of it's real. It's, it's, it's kind of like the opposite of what they're maintaining. Um, and so you've got to be careful. And it is equated with abomination to the Lord. Uh, now when you think of abomination, you think of a lot of different things. Rarely do you ever consider a forward heart to be an abomination to the Lord, but it is. Uh, when you think about how horrible it, it would be to sum up a person's life as an abomination. I mean, that's the end result. Go back to Genesis 6. Genesis 6. The uh, descendants of Cain, so I guess we'll just call them Cainites, uh, before the Canaanites. These are the uh, descendants of Cain. And we read in chapter 6, in verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. So these, these were people that were descendants of Cain. They remember they went out and started civilization and blah, blah, blah. And this is where it all wound up. Uh, they, their, their lives were abomination. And you go to verse 6, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and he grieved him at his heart. So the lifestyle of those prior to the flood were so much more abomination that the Lord repented that he had ever made man. Can you imagine? Here's, we, we go back in, in, in chapter 1 and chapter 2, and God saw that everything he made was good. He didn't make anything that was bad. And here, here you are a, a little bit later, and God's... God is wishing I never did this. Uh, their behavior called for judgment, and judgment came. Think about the progression of sin. And go to Romans chapter 1. Think about the progression of sin in Romans chapter 1. And sin is progressive. Uh, you don't start with the end result, you start with the beginning and it's usually very small, it's a simple little thing and uh, you may get caught in it and you may not get caught in it, but it doesn't matter. Uh, if it's not judged, 
the lost soul tries more and more and more. So we'll start here in verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So there's no excuse for anybody to say, I believe in evolution. Because you, you are built with something that says, you may not know who God is, but this was, this was made, this was created. Surely it couldn't happen by chance. All right. I believe that if you, you accept that, then the Lord will give you more, more light. But these people, look what, look what happens because that 21, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful but became vain in their imaginations and in their foolish heart was darkened, professing them, themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image make, made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, in light of that, God gave them over, up to uncleanness, to the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. All right, so where did it start? With denying, the, the, denying what was built into you that there is a creator. Evolution is the denial that you created. So it's a denial of any responsibility to a creator. So that's, that's where this all started. Now watch what happens. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. For this cause, God gave them up, second time, to vile affections, even for even their women did change their natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men. All right, so you see how it, it's progressing. Then we come to verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So you get step by step by step down. And the reprobate mind... I mean, there's a list there, and verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Now, there, there is much on the scene now that is of a reprobate mind that's going on. All right, you couple that. Let's go to 2 Timothy 3. We might as well hit all of these or a few, a few more. Second Timothy chapter three. We're talking about a life that is summed up by abomination. All right, Second Timothy chapter three, verse one. Now, in most of the Bibles I have, I, make, I, may, I circle a word, and I'll show you where. This know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. I circle shall, and I put have. All right, we're living in have, not shall. And then there's a list, and there's 19 things there. And then in verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. So again, it's a froward heart. There's, there's nothing real about this. These are, these are people that used to show something, but now they're so bad this is what they are, and these are, these are people that are not secular people. These are religious people. These are people in a lot of different churches all around the world. Uh, from such, turn away. And then in Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. And look here in verse 1. Second Peter 2, 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, Old Testament, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. All of these things are, are, are brought out in a froward heart. 
and a froward heart is an abomination to God. All right, on the other side, how blessed it, it will be to have his word of approval on our lives. And, and it's easy to make the comparison. The life of Enoch, back in, in uh, Genesis, was such, Genesis 5, 24, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. He was here, and then he was there. And if it's the same thing as the rapture, in the twinkling of an eye. I mean, he took one step, and he never took the second step, and he was there with the Lord. So, um, go with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Same character, more explanation, and important explanation. By faith, verse 5, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Think of it. He's living in the worst of, of, of times before the flood, crooked, perverse, unbelief, and he didn't engage in any of that. Uh, he didn't live that way at all. He pleased God because, verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of, of them that diligently seek him. So th where, where does wisdom see, stand in all of this? Because God has an all-seeing eye. He sees, every, he sees everything about us. He sees everybody about us here and away from here. He's seen our past, he's seen our today. He already knows our future. But I mean, it's, uh, wouldn't you like to appear before the Lord and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant? I mean, I know I would. I would hope that you would. I certainly wouldn't uh, have my life, want my life to be uh, characterized by abomination. And, it, and, the, and the word spells it out so clearly. A froward heart is abomination. All right, so let's go back here, chapter 11, Proverbs chapter 11. And he says, but such as are upright in their way are his delight. And who are those? I mean, we're contrasting righteousness with unrighteousness, okay? Verse 21, though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. All right, so here we have sinful agreement with divine deliverance. Uh, politicians of our government, of the House and of the Senate, draw up bills many times, not many times, but draw up bills that are, that are evil, and they vote on those bills, agreeing together with measure uh, and without a pinhead of divine wisdom. It is what is going to fill my pockets, what is going to buy votes, um, not what is right and, and versus what is wrong in, in response to the word of God. And afterwards, it, may, may, it even goes to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court uh, makes their, they hear the objections and they get together and they they vote on something and then they congratulate themselves and they shake hands, all of them, in celebration of their wicked deeds. Let me give you some examples. The murder of children in the womb. We have, we have there were bills made and then there was a Supreme Court and they shook hands on this, the evil hands. They got together. They shook hands on this. This is, this is a great thing. Um, the legalization of destructive drugs. Thank you, Morgan and Morgan, and all the people you shook hands with that allows the state of Florida to legalize dangerous drugs. Um, giving credibility to sexual deviance and legislating sex perversion as a civil right. Um, allowing the 
biblical marriage to be perverted, allowing pornography to continue. Isn't it amazing? We have a, we have a government, we have a Supreme Court that will not legislate pornography because they said it's the right of free speech. Now, though hand join in hand, the wicked will not go unpunished. Uh, lawyers, judges, people held in high degree, enabling domestic abuse, sexual abuse, mental abuse, um, physical abuse, mainline denominations, approving of much the same as politicians and ordaining perverted men and women to lead congregations and, be in, and teach in seminaries. Uh, and many times the religions, they don't want to lose people because as they lose people, they lose money. And so money becomes part of this. And uh, I read right here, God, God tells me in the word, they will not go unpunished. I, I have a promise there. Even though it looks like today the devil is winning in so many areas, it will not go unpunished. And deliverance will come in due time to the righteous. Maybe it won't be this month. There's only three more days in this, four more days in this month. But it could be. Maybe it won't come this year. Maybe it won't come in your lifetime. But it will come. I've written down somewhere, I've got it on my notes, uh, on my phone. God is, going to, God is going to avenge the wrong that's been done. And that's, a, and that's a, a dangerous thing to think anybody has gotten away with anything, even though they have for now. They're not. And, and to think that Instead of, instead of repentance, instead of sorrow, instead of asking forgiveness, instead of trying to make it right, they feel they're in the right and suddenly stand before a holy God. And he's going to bring, meet out the judgment. Do you realize how severe that's going to be compared to what you could have had if you just made things right all along? Great. It's a great... It's a sad verse, but it's a great verse because we see it going on. It's happening all the time, all around, and people agree. Let's say I wanted to, I can't, no, I can't, I'll, I'll make another situation. Let's say a guy gets sick of being married. And so he shops around and he hires somebody to kill his wife. And they shake on it. That happens more than more times than not. There was a, a famous one there in Orlando a few years back, and uh, he wanted to get rid of his wife. They shook hands on it, didn't know that the guy was undercover, and he wanted his wife killed. He, he wanted to dispose of her. He just didn't want to get a divorce. He just wanted to dispose of her. All right? That happens all the time. You know, and if it happens among us, Against us, we have the promise, the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. We have that. We ought to claim that and, and realize you try, to, you try to make changes, you try to get this thing turned around, but many times it doesn't. Deliverance will come. Uh, and God's going to avenge all this wrongdoing. All right, now, in the next two verses, uh, we have some uh, confusing values. So in verse 22, uh, we have a deceptive appearance. As, as a jewel of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman, which is without discretion. Now, are, are the words of scripture taught, tried words? Are, are they, did, did God just all of a sudden, or Solomon as he was writing this, the Holy Spirit said, uh, I don't really know how to put this in words. You, you put it into words. No, the words are exactly what he, said, what he wanted printed. And uh, this, this comparison, I believe, is, is, 
is uh, chosen for the purpose of setting before us really an outrageous disparity. And I'm saying that because the, of the emphasis that we should have. There's a conjunction of two things whose, use, whose union is disproportionately inappropriate. And in the Christian life, when you walked into the Christian life, you really didn't know the road ahead. You entered as a babe in Christ. And so you needed to be educated. And, and so we, needed, we need to be educated both with, with judgment and taste or feeling, I guess. In other words, it's necessary that we should both see the thing to be revolting and feel it to be revolting. It's one, it's one thing to say you believe this about that. It's another thing to say you believe that and, and feel it to be right or to be wrong, in this case to be wrong. You put, you put, you put something into it, you put yourself into it. We, we need both to have our understanding exercised and then to act in wisdom. So, we are to live our lives before we get back, we get to this verse. We are to exercise our lives to love that which is lovely, that which is pure, that which is innocent, and to hate that which is hateful. A righteous man loathes evil as much as he loves God or loves good. If you have a soft opinion of good, you're going to have a soft opinion about evil. If you have a compromised view of good, you'll have a compromised view of evil. It's proportional. If you have a high view of God, you will, you will live differently as though if you have a low view of God. I mean, there are many people who have a very low view and think he's just like us. And we've drawn him down to our level. Uh, I would rather be drawn up to his level than me draw him down to, to ours. So this leads us back to the verse. And we're talking about, we're talking about beauty. Um, we're talking about personal beauty. And personal beauty is not something to be despised. Um, it is, after all, the work of God. And none of his works were done in vain. None of his works were, were poorly constructed, that, that they weren't evil. We are created in the, in the image of God. We are the highest beauty of creation. There's nothing higher than we are in creation. Uh, so beauty is essentially a talent. It's a gift, obviously, and it has power. But if the beauty is not combined with good, and honesty and purity, it comes the object of disgust and a cause for ruination. And, and I'm going there, obviously, with this. So the verse sticks out because we've spent time in the book of Proverbs, chapter 7, part of chapter 5. I think there was something in 6. There might have been something in, in 8 or 9. Um, and then and these were dedicated to, you know, there there's sections or passages dedicated to the strange woman. And then suddenly, we're going through here, we're making these contrasts, uh, our character and so forth, and it, gets, and it gets real personal. A man is to beware of being tricked, you could say being tempted and caught and ultimately chained by a woman's beauty so as to be dragged by the mire um, by the bewitching charm that she emits. Now, my dad was in Central Intelligence Corps, uh, Army Central Intelligence, not CIA. It was the military version. And he would bring me books 
and he would show me all the, the fronts that were going on in the government. And I never knew that he was deemed a spook. The spook were, were people that caught spies. And when he did say something, he said, the vast majority of spies were beautiful women. Russia, the Soviet Union used them, Eastern Germany used them, China used them. Uh, why is that? Because that charm tricks guys and to give up secrets. And, and, and so this is why I'm saying this is why a man is, has, has to be very careful. So when an impure character, it can be a man too, but it's, and uh, but we're speaking about a woman, in dazzling uh, loveliness. It is the spirit of darkness appearing as an angel of light. Enticing, only to devour. Now, that goes beyond male to female, obviously. It goes to the gospel. In Galatians 1, and you know, I, I marvel that you've been so soon removed from the gospel of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. So somebody came along, and with smooth words, and it sounded so good, the way they could present it, that what Paul told them, that salvation in Christ is not enough. I mean, it's good, but it's not enough. You need, you need to be circumcised to keep the ceremonial law of, of Moses. And it sounded good. And they corrupted a lot, of, a lot of the believers because of the charm that they had. I don't think it was women, but I'm, I'm trying to give you an idea how this works. Somebody can come along and, and if you're not careful, trick you into giving up everything you believe. We had, I know of a, a teacher in graduate school, an effective teacher in graduate school whose son said, I'm done, and went out to Utah, became a Mormon. And everybody wondered, how could you possibly do that? Can't you see the difference between these? Somebody, somebody with clever words and smooth speeches seduced him into thinking, there's really no difference. We both believe in Jesus. I mean, I even had those people in Montana say, hey, we both believe in the same Jesus. But I didn't buy that. They don't believe in the same Jesus. They don't believe anything like we believe. But they cover it up. That's, that's to have the culture successful. They don't tell you who they are and what they are. Uh, so all of, this, all of this is put together. A woman who's proud and selfish and uh, what else? False is already miserable and dangerous to other people. And sometimes, in most cases, even in crime, you don't see it. And so we look at this and we see this is a combination to be loathed and shunned, regardless of the cost. And think of it, a pig wallowing in the mire is, is there is not a creature that you would follow and embrace, would it? No, of course not. Even with a solid gold jewel in its nose. That's, the, that's the, how it's put together. So women have, who have beauty above uh, the average should be extremely watchful lest they, they sin and suffer here. You already have, you already have a jewel of God, don't put it in a pig's nose. The misapplication will prostitute the gift. And that misapplication will be repulsive to all, everybody whose tastes are true and honest and pure. It will attract the vain and repel the, uh, repel the beauty. So when you attach beauty to virtue, it's incomparably lovely. But you have the absence of discretion 
It's, a, it's, it's sad. It really is. But you've got to see through that. All right? That happens through biblical education in the Word. You have, if you do this theologically, you need to do it physically. Because you think, since I know the scripture, then I'll, I'll be safe. No, you got, you've got to understand, and we'll get to this, you still have an old nature. And your old nature is, like the, is, is almost like that woman. And there's no discretion in the old nature. None. And you can, you can make the most wonderful excuses for not doing the right thing, for not doing God's will, because of the old nature. And somebody will come along and say, though, this is more important than you being here. This is more important than you doing that. No, it's not. Great verse. I mean, just boom, out of, out of nowhere. Okay, verse 23. There is that the desire of the righteous is only good, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath. Okay, verse 23, you have divine versus depraved. Now remember, we're, we, these are confusing values. The divine and the depraved. When you and I received the Lord as Savior, we received the indwelling Holy Spirit upon belief. Uh, we received a new nature. And the new, the new nature has new affections. You did not get the new nature five years after you were saved, or the Holy Spirit five years after you were saved. At the moment you were saved, you got that, and even though they weren't identified, I don't think it's clearly to you, because again, you, this comes through the word, uh, you had new affections. I mean, it's, it's every creature after its kind. So I didn't know what happened to me when I got saved. Nobody, the preacher never told me. And so here I've got the indwelling Holy Spirit, I've got the new nature, and suddenly I'm miserable because I still got the old nature and the things that, that I did before I was saved conflicted with something that was taking place inwardly even though I couldn't identify it. <clears throat> and it was horrible until I finally found out what was going on. Sometimes in, we, we, I think, are remiss in letting people know that when you get saved, what is happening? And, and what is God trying to do? And, and if you've got history, then you've got to pack up that history and shut it up. I mean, it talked about putting on the new man, putting off the old man. And it takes effort. And uh, that those desires of the new man uh, that were put on only in salvation are only good. That's why Ephesians 2.10, but we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. I did. Would you have known what they were? No, we find them out through the word and be in, in, a, in a place where they're identified. <clears throat> I was not in that place. The desires of the old nature are not yet destroyed. Look at Paul. I mean, this in, in Romans chapter 7, we're dealing with a man that goes out and starts all these, these churches, has people come to Christ, and, uh, and then starts a church and goes into everywhere else. <clears throat> and so... He's saying, in, in some, somewhere is an estimate about 30 years after he was saved, he's writing this in verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Imagine, can you say that? I can. 
For to will to is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I, I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. What's, what's taking place? He's talking about the, the two natures that we, that we have. I, I am in a lifelong battle. The battle is raging as much today as it was when I first got saved. I know more. I've, I've gained more. I've grown more. I've, I've had more victories, but the battle's still raging. And it's not going to go away until, until I, I have gone home to be with the Lord or he comes to get it. You, uh, when you leave here, and even before you leave here, you can come here. You could have filled your mind with putrid things before you came here. It's hard to get them out. This is one of the things that I'm so adamantly opposed to the music that goes on in many of these churches for hours before, before any kind of a message. You put all that, that putrid into you, all that fleshly stuff, and then suddenly you're going to turn that off and, and get all the spiritual things and all that worldly things going to go? No. The, the spiritual has no effect. I've tainted myself with all this worldly music. I don't care what the words say. I don't care how they swoon and everything else. The, if the music's bad, then the word is not going to get through. It's just, you, how is that worshiping in spirit and in truth? It's not. So, you can identify your, your affections by, by this. This verse, the pure has power to overcome the evil. The pure has, uh, has power to overcome the impure. The pure has, over, has power to overcome the flesh. I mean, if we looked at the, at the verses, but put on the new man in Ephesians 4, look at the things that the new man has to do in opposition to the old man. You have the power to be everything that's described there and, and to not be by everything that's described there. Now, I forgot where we were. The desire of the righteous is only good, but the expectation of the wicked is rest. Now, strangely, for the lost, in many cases they feel hopeless and unable to uh, get anything spiritual or to be saved and uh, and they dwell in the the end of their hopelessness I read books before I was saved and they all had to do with this idea of, of, of the hopelessness you can't control the hopelessness and the hopelessness is just coming cl closer and closer and closer existentialism don't I have no idea why I read things like that uh, but I did and and I remember the book I forgot who wrote it, but he said the ceiling was closing down and the walls were closing in and the floor was coming up. And you're feeling this in no doors and there's no light. What do you do? You die. You kill yourself. There's no hope. None whatsoever. Look at the slew of old and some not too old uh, who have taken their lives these last four months. A young guy kills his wife and child, tries to kill himself, doesn't quite do the job. Here's a rock band, Christian, Christian rock band, and one of the lead performers said, I don't even believe in God anymore. And, and why are these people committing suicide now that you've got these lockdowns? They're hopeless. They have no hope, none whatsoever. Uh, it defies human ex explanation, but not divine. The explanation's given right there. I mean, we live in a time where the gospel gets out uh, as never before. I mean, we send it all over the world to anyone that will listen. 
It's available. We give it out, person to person, uh, and in many places in this country. And you think there's a hopelessness that is almost equal to Noah's day. Every man is doing that which is evil in his heart continually. I mean, you know, among the lost. And so there's a, a great disconnect here somewhere. I, I went to a, a meeting down in South Florida a long time ago when we lived down there, and there were two evangelists preaching. One was Carl Hatch. You may, may or may not know about him. Uh, he's quite a character. <clears throat> And so I bought some tapes and I was listening to one afterwards. And uh, he told of visiting a family in Hialeah, which is where his church was, um, who visited his church, only the, the wife came, the wife and mother. And so he went over to the house later in the week and uh, introduced himself and the wife welcomed him into the house. And he said her husband was in the other room with some, some men and so she walked him into this room, and they were playing cards. They're probably gambling, I think. And the husband was there. He didn't have a shirt on. They were all smoking. Uh, they were drinking. And, and so uh, Carl Hatch introduced himself. You know, your wife came uh, last week, and he got into the gospel and spoke for a few minutes to every one of them that were there. And the husband looks up at him and says, Man... I know I'm going to hell. Don't care who knows it. Don't want to hear what you're peddling. So Hatch replied, Well, sir, let's pray right now. Let's pray right now that you get there tonight. And he put his hand on his shoulder and he prayed, Lord, grant this man his wish tonight. Let him go to hell. Let him see what it's like. I pray in Jesus' name. Well, he was kind of spooked. Obviously so. Uh, shaken. And Hatch left. Had no idea what was going to happen. Uh, the mother and a couple of kids came to church. And they were saved, but not the husband. And sometime down the road, the husband came and got saved. Look what it says, expectation of the wicked is wrath. I'm going to hell and I don't care. Have you ever heard anybody say, I've heard somebody say something that, close to that, not as dramatic, but hey, you know, what do I care? So we read it another time as, the desire of the righteous is only good, but the action of the wicked is wrath. There's great wisdom. We've only, what do we do, four verses? Great wisdom we looked at tonight. So now let's go out and apply it. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for this time in your word. Uh, we are in a, in, a, in a book that deals with wisdom. And wisdom is something that we, we take for granted. We think we can just call you and not be in your word and suddenly you'll grant it to us. I think in an emergency, that maybe, but in all likelihood, we just need where wisdom is found, how it's applied, and then we have to apply it. I just pray that the few things we looked at tonight make some sense in our everyday lives, and that we will put them to use in our lives, and be able to help others as well. Uh, there's a sense in which the things we've looked at uh, can be intellectual, academic, but these are practical. These are things we need to put to use. And we pray now these things in Jesus' name. Amen.